Uh, I'm Mark Fernandez, and that's Dennis Zen. And we were just talking about your work, and we were saying, man, like, everything you've done is a hit. You know, we were just talking about a Banshee, which is kind of like, you know, we uh, Dennis and I are both huge fans of the boys, and and I think more importantly, big fans of Anthony Starr, um, who's who's just such an incredible actor, right? Like, like when you see him work, you're like, damn, like where where's this guy been? And the answer to that is that he was on Banshee, you know, like like that's where he really got his, you know, cut his teeth. Yeah, we plucked him out of uh, New Zealand. He was doing, you know, he was doing a series there and he was a self tape. And, you know, we were, um, his tape came in really late. We were down the road with another actor and the, at the last second before we were going to bring the actor to HBO, he dropped out and we were like, not scrambling, but we like, we were like heading towards production. So we started going through tapes again. And then like Ant's tape showed up, like it showed up after, like we hadn't seen it prior to that. And then mm. like, you know, his hair was really long and he was, you know, he was looking for the character, but it was, it was like enough of a read to fly him sight unseen essentially without, you know, to the States to come test. We're like, we, we didn't even have, even do like a callback. We're just like, get him to America and let's, let's see. Well, and and like, that's always fascinates me because I've been part of casting, you know, steps myself. And like, what is it about you as a director that when you see something in something as rough as a tape, which usually is either like on a cell phone or a cat, you know, like a, like a camcorder at best, like what is it about the performance that makes you think, okay, this guy is going to be an awesome color for me to paint with. You know, you're, you know, you, you, you have to forgive a lot of things. You know, I think that, you know, when you see actors show up and they're going to come play a cop and they come in a cop costume, I don't think those things help you. It's like you, you, Mm -hmm. but you have to forgive a lot of lack of context, you you know, and, and, and actually, you know, the, 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 the death of in-person casting, you know, due to, um, you know, uh, you know, so many, you know, the, not just pre pandemic was, and is like one of the, the losses the, on the, on the upside, you get the world can audition. Mm-hmm. The downside is you lose that ability to interact and hone the performance in the room. When you see a spark, it's like, sure. Now you've got actually more work because you got to call them back. Then you got to talk to them and do it in a different way. Whereas like you miss the energy in the room that you, that you can share, which is actually how you're going to work on the day like you don't direct by phone and then get another self tape you know you you're you're there to to watch it in real time so it's you're 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 looking for a lot of things i think you're looking for you know do you guys do you mesh with the same kind of language like am i speaking a language and then do they take the notes do they know how to interpret what you're Mm. what you're after sometimes you're throwing them stuff just to see how they like what they do you know, like you couldn't throw, I've worked with actors or you could throw a rattlesnake in their lap and they're going to like <laughs> just run with it. You know, you want to see, do you get, you know, sometimes you give notes and you get the exact same performance that they were sure. like right in front of their mirror the whole time. And that, you know, doesn't help you either. So, um, and you try to imagine them, you try to, and, and also, you know, the other thing is you put them up against the rest of the, you know, I sort of build out the, not a grid, but like you want to see them in the rest of the ensemble. Like a lot mm-hmm. of the work, I mean, Banshee's an ensemble. I mean, the, the, the missive to, to Alexa was, Alexa Fogel was, you know, the work she did on The Wire and on Oz and how everybody on those shows became famous. I'm like, I want that for this. Like, I want, we, we don't have the budget to afford anybody with a name. Like Frankie right. Plazon was the most seen face that we had, but everybody had to come in and be able to, you know, go on to other things. We want to be the show, just like you said, like, man, that guy's from Banshee. Like, that's what I right. hope. Right, right. The ant star is that that somebody someday is going to be like, hey, I saw that guy on Banshee for the first time. Yeah, and, and like you know, when when I used to own uh, Collider, um, you know, not that long ago, and I was like, man, who is this Anthony Star? Like this kid is really talented, and everybody's like, oh man, you got to check out Banshee. You got to check out Banshee. You got to check out Banshee. Collider so, was like good to us on Banshee with Banshee too. Oh, we were great to you guys. That's how I heard, you know, all about it. You know, um, yeah, yeah, you know, Collider's great. You know, I'm, I'm still very close with all those folks. Um, so, so let me, you know, first of all, because you said something really fascinating that kind of implies a paradigm shift that you've almost accepted 
So do you think that moving forward, the casting process will be completely remote? Or do you think it'll slowly kind of go back to the old method of that face-to-face -face interaction? Or do you think we've evolved past that and now this is the way that we do it? I think the, I think the vacuum, it's funny, you know, you used to have, you know, like, let's just take when I was doing house, right? There'd be a day of my seven days of prep on house that was completely dedicated to casting. Like, mm. you go in, you just spend the day at the casting, people That's would come in. And that was part of the prep. And then once you could do this, you know, self tape, you could, it's a website called cast it and it puts up all the self tapes and you can kind of watch them on the upside. You know, what ends up happening is, you know, if something's not working, you don't have to suffer through it. So if somebody's wrong, you can, you can move more efficiently through casting. Um, and, but the problem is it's like, then you have now you have you know so many more producers on things that there's these like insane email threads where everybody's chiming in and you know i try to streamline those when i'm running my own shows i streamline those i really just want to hear what the director has to think um when i'm on something i usually just skip i try to understand who really is the person making the decisions and i directly correspond to them so there's one voice yeah. but you know before like sometimes you're in a van scouting and then everybody's already chimed in before the director. So, you know, I also do a lot of work with the director's guild and making sure the directors keep their voice in the mix with casting is critical and electronic casting has made that challenging. So interesting. I don't know if it'll just be a hybrid. I think depending on the scale of what you're doing, like I did a little bit of in-person casting on house of the dragon. I didn't have many new roles to cast. I just had a, a one particular one in the finale. Um, most everybody had already been cast at that point, you know, and then yeah. the occasional Westrosi soldier that's, you know, in the opening of episode three or, um, but those were, those were done on tape, but there was, you know, some stuff with like, you know, um, you know, actors in their, you know, young teens that I wanted to work in person because, you know, working with kids or young or young actors can be really challenging. You might get sure. Jody Foster or uh, uh, you know, Macaulay Culkin, or you might get, you know, some Disney kid that's rehearsed. You know, Jake Paul. Times. Yeah, you might get Jake Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you, get stuff you, you can see where it's like they've memorized it. Their parents have just done it. They're just like right. saying words. Like that was, you know, that was, you know, in, in you know, with respect to our, our really young actress in episode two, you know, who played Lena, you know, that we we got her with a coach because I could see that 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 had mm. happened. You know, she was so pre prepared, like almost over prepared. There was no room. She was just kind of like waiting for the cue word to say the next line. And we just had to go through line by line in an age appropriate way and have her understand what the scene was about. Yeah. To get and, and and for me, because look, first of all, I I love to take us back in time and get your kind of upbringing. But since you brought up Lena, because um, during the COVID uh, period, I actually read uh, Fire and Blood because, you know, there wasn't a lot to do and, you know, reading became something that, you know, you can help kill the time. So I actually read it. I only read it once and I'm not a super scholar on the topic, but I do remember the Lena character being a little bit older. I, From what I recall in the book, I could be totally wrong. Was there like a choice to make her a little bit younger to, to sort of create a little bit more tension between the decision you that... Know, I yeah, I wouldn't be able to answer that because I don't know what was in Ryan's. You know, Ryan's so, you know, steeped in the books and knows sure. George. Um, his exact reasoning. I do know that, like, on the day we talked about the awkward walk, you know, right, which right. was like the image of, you know, him having, I'm sure it was probably done too, so that you could really, you know, I, I we really like that image of him having to like bend down to listen to her, you know? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That ear and she's on his bad side and you're like, you're like, what? You know, and, and it also makes look and first of all, there's going to be tons of spoilers for episode two and three and also one. So, you know, you've been warned, but it also creates this really good contrast for why he makes the decision that he makes to be, you know, to choose Allison as his, you know, wife. Right. Versus like, you know, doing the right thing via politics. But there was something inside of look, this is what I got from it. But there was something inside of him as a human being that still has some like moral center that, you know, he knows right from wrong and he knows that this is too premature, you know, and he knows that like, this is a wrong thing for him to do. I mean, that's the, that's the thing I'm a, you know, 
the father of a daughter, you know, my daughter Electra is, right. uh, you know, and I, you know, I came back to my relationship. I'm a single dad and I come back to my relationship to her so many times in the course mm -hmm. of episode two, especially to some extent three, you know, because I'm heading into those years with her. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a, um, you know, that, you know, feeling, you know, I mean, now I'm engaged now, but like, you know, it was so important to me that my daughter was like the first person I talked to about who and, you know, getting engaged and asking my fiance to marry me. It was so important that she mm, had that's interesting. agency over that. And, you know, and it was, and it was interesting because I got engaged after doing the show and I kept thinking about that. I was like, man, like if I didn't tell Electra what I was up to, you know, she would kill me. You know, and it would like be something be like unforgivable, you know, right. And I know. And, you know, and I know. And so, you know, the idea not only is it like I'm marrying your best friend, but it's, you know, it's a, you know, un like understanding the, 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 like, you know, the duties as king, but the heart wants what the heart wants. Right. So mm. you know, that's why and he was in love with his wife and the idea, you know, that he's so conflicted. So this is like the next best alternative. Like, because look, I, I, and I'm going to get to this and I'm all over the place here, but your Dune miniseries, I think is the truest, most faithful adaptation of a book. That's very dear to me. And probably the first true novel I ever read, um, like as a human being was, was Dune. My, my brother gave it to me cause I was a huge fan of star Wars and he just saw this book in the, like, you know how like schools used to have the book fair, like, like right. once in a while, you know, he got a copy classic of Dune. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. The classic book fair. And I was like, what the hell is this? You know, he's like, I don't know. It's supposed to be some famous sci-fi thing. There's a movie coming out about it. Um, and I read that book and it stuck with me my whole life. I mean, it's such an incredible piece of literature. Um, and your miniseries talk about during a time where television didn't really have those big, crazy productions. Um, and that Dune miniseries elevated itself to such a, a high level that television wasn't really used to, right? Like, Television had the Sopranos, it had Oz, it had the beginnings yeah. of The Wire, but it wasn't really a thing, right? It had Star Trek, and then it was all the WB shows, right? Like the right. Electra or, or, or whatever all those weird shows were. And then here comes this amazing, you know, miniseries that you pulled off with pr pretty, pretty much one of the most difficult. Less than one episode of House of the Dragon. That's incredible. Significantly less. All six hours. So it was, you know, I think that the, the, the important thing about, I, I mean, not dissimilar to what we did with House of the Dragon, you know, we were really, in a way, we're really season eight of or nine of Game of Thrones. So, right. you know, that's, it's not, we're not a first season show trying to break through. We're really, you know, the continuation We're we're, we're, you know, and so that was the same, you know, we had the previous miniseries, which I thought was a, a good adaptation. You know, so I'm inheriting, you know, I, th I thought Denny Villeneuve, what he did was absolutely astonishing. Yeah. With Dune and the Dune I would have loved to have made. I mean, remember that was the Dune I made, Children of Dune, which is the you know Dune Messiah and Children of Dune, the sure. book. It was the first thing in television issue digital. So I was using a new format. The only thing that had shot digital before that was Phantom Menace, which was the Star Wars prequel, coincidentally. And, you know, we used the first miniseries as kind of R&D to improve on but still keep in the same kind of world of the first miniseries but that event miniseries and getting susan sarandon to be in it mm -hmm. and pay her a million dollars you know it was like that was like a big deal to get like a movie star to come do a tv series that william hurt was in the first one yeah 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 you know, who i later got to work with in uh damages you know and he you know that that was i mean it was a, it was a special time and interestingly the closest closest experience to doing that was working on house of the dragon like that wow. you know just because you know you wanted to make something that i wanted to make something that my fiance who does not like particularly care for sci-fi fantasy could watch it know exactly what's going on did not have to read any of the books and that's what i tried to mm -hmm. do with dune is like before one visual effect is in that story and i come from a big greek family and so the family complexities are what attracted to me but i saw you know i saw a cut of Children of Dune that didn't have one effect in it. And I was like, this is great. It's James McAvoy's first job. Right. And, you know, like the, the human family drama is terrific. And like, I'm yeah. so happy with that. It's very poppy and, you know, 
very warm and I'm doing a lot of things, but because it's source material for Star Wars, I also felt like I was like, you know, directing Jedi's and hoods and stuff. So I, <laughs> right, right. You mentioned so, you mentioned something interesting about you know getting uh, Susan Sarandon on there and how it was a big deal. And you've been in the television game for a long, long time. And how do you feel now about how the the kind of lines between like the movie stars and TV stars are a lot more blurred, mm-hmm. and, and they're kind of you have big stars coming to television to work on stuff versus, you know, back in the day, there was kind of a stigma attached. You know, I mean, I've been through every, from my squeaky chair, Mr. Um, you know, I've been through every iteration of it. You know, I've been in the business, so I've, dra- I've been directing 30 years, right? So I started in syndicated television, which doesn't exist anymore. Mm. Um, that was like very genre stuff. Most people know Baywatch. You know, I didn't direct Baywatch, but, but I directed Pamela's other show, VIP. You know, they were these were genre shows that would be on at like five in the afternoon, you know, on Fox <laughs> in Kansas, but at 6 30 in KTLA in LA. You know, it's like it was, it was, it was like, you know, 70 plus companies made television when I was making television. And now there's, you know, now there's more with the streamers. But once it got all, once you could own your studio and your network, once the Clintons deregulated that, that changed the game. And like it, like everything went in and then streaming blew it all back up again, which is mm, incredible. And that's interesting. And I work, you know, I do a lot of work with the guild and there's not been since the day I got into the business 30 years ago, there has not been a decline in scripted content that it is. It has been a growth business for 30 years. There's not been less shows there every year. There's more hours of scripted television out there. Mm. And, and that's a trend that you see to this day. To this day, since the day I got yeah. in the business, that's actually what pushed me into television over, over film. I mean, to answer your question, which I'm not answering, is um, I, you know, I still think a good story. I think in television, the intimacy of television, like, I, you know, I didn't see the terminal list, and I know Chris Pratt's in that, but that didn't attract me to it because he's in it. I think mm. that I, I don't think necessarily a movie star brings you to television. Although when I really felt the game changed, I was sitting in Soho House at a lunch and through the glass windows behind, I could see Sunset Boulevard and there was a huge poster for True Detective and there was Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. And I'm like, mm. everything's going to change. Like that right. looked amazing. It was compelling and it had movie stars. You got to sit in a six or eight hour movie with those characters was fantastic. Right. So, you know, but TV still works. Like, you know, I mean, Station Eleven didn't have yeah. you know, movie stars. Severance didn't have movie stars. I worked with Adam on Twilight Zone. And those shows were as compelling as anything out there. So I, I don't know if it's blurred. I just think it's now more okay, um, you know. And working with Jeff Bridges, you know, I just did the old man, you know. That yeah, was, I know, which is another monster you know. hit. Like, yeah, people that was, love love that show. Like, and uh, exactly I haven't seen it yet, but they love it. It's great. You know, you'll it, you know the season was cut short because of the pandemic and because of Jeff's illness and. I think a lot of great story is going to move into season two for that show, but, you know, working with John Lithgow and working with that, but I felt like, you know, I could feel that shift happening. Like I was doing damages, you know, I was bringing over, you know, I was working with Glenn Close before she did TV, you know, like she was like, right. you know, I helped like segue that. And I was working with actors as they were starting to make the move into television and sort of like, at first it was like a place you go as you're kind of winding down. And now it's like an exciting place of possibility, but it, I, I don't think, you know, you like, I mean, I would love to see Tom Cruise in a TV series, but you know, because I know the quality <laughs> of which, how good it would be. Right? right. It would be incredible. It would be absolutely incredible. Yeah. Ha- have him redo Legend as a TV series. I have to ask this out of curiosity. Did you watch Terminal List? Did you ever get around to I it? Did not. I did not. I say that, you know, I had okay. a friend in it. I watched the trailer. Uh, it is way down on my list of stuff sure sure see. first yeah. of all it, it, it's extremely good just like quick editorial on it i thought it was extremely well made except for the cinematography and this is just my own personal opinion the cinematography is abhorrent everything yeah. looks like one weird low contrast weird it, it's i have no idea who shot that but like you know somebody needs to have a chat with them but um the, the story is actually very good. Kind of a throwback to the old Tom Clancy stuff. Oh, good. Of, I of like, it. It's on my like list of stuff. You know, I, I keep a list in my notes section of my iPhone and I'm like, you know, what, anytime I hear something that's sort of interesting, I just write it down. Cause I never, I, when I'm looking for something, 
you know, we we're actually watching season three of Fauda right now on Netflix. Which of which one? Which one? Fauda. So it's an Israeli series. Oh, okay. Um, I haven't heard of it. I, I've been hearing about it since Banshee. You know, like I've been hearing mm. about it forever. And I saw the Israeli show on Hulu called False Flag that was fucking great as well as was Fauda, and you know, like dark, you know, on Netflix, like some of these foreign productions are really like, I mean, I couldn't get enough of dark. Like it was the perfect yeah. amount of episodes. It was the right amount of weird. I ate it up. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Could yeah. Not the, the, the first one I remember that made that crossover before Homeland, you know, before we got the Homeland stuff was this show called Epitaphios on HBO. I don't know if you ever heard, like heard of that one, yeah. but it, but, but it was kind of like a science of the lambs, uh, thing where you know they're hunting down this serial killer who's still able to commit murders even though you know they they found them dead um and i don't want to spoil it too much because i thought it was a, you know extremely good and then and then which one is that dennis the money long the uh the the uh spanish show yes yes that? okay yeah yeah it's very good it's argentinian yeah. that one's argentinian okay. uh, so it has that kind of jorge luis borges labyrinth you know kind of like messing with the mind thing it's very well okay. done all right and then there's and there's also the spanish show that everybody loves um uh the, the money heist show i haven't seen that one yet. oh yeah i haven't yeah. started i've started like the first five minutes and then i get pulled to something and I, it's on my list it's on my list yeah yeah um, so so look um just to kind of because i'm really intrigued by your by your kind of like like origin story can you just give it to me like in a few minutes like yeah. Like, uh, you know, where did it come? Because, like, you know, for my show, what I try to instill on my audience is that anybody can do whatever they want as long as they just stick to it, you know? So it's always good to know where where that little spark started that has led to all this amazing work you've done. I totally, I completely agree to that. And actually, you know, I had, a, I, you know, my, my, as you can imagine, my Instagram blew up with, um, you know, with, with the show and these past episodes. Yeah. And I get, I'm actually, you know, I... I, you know, I've got some great mentees and mentors, some really, you know, great young talent. I'm a product of mentorship. And so yeah. that's it's very important. You know, I think that's one of the most key things. And I do try to answer when young filmmakers, you know, write me on my account if, if I can, if I can give a thoughtful response. But, you know, what I tell people too, you know, it's something, it was something my teacher said to me when I was, you know, weirdly in an accounting class in high school, that they, <laughs> like after home ec, they were like, my teacher said, you know, there's a lot of roads to Boston. Right. And that never, I'm from, I'm from, I'm from just outside Boston. So I was like, oh yeah, that makes, that's like that, that stayed with me. There's a lot of ways to solve problems. Mm. There's a lot of, there's a lot of journeys people can have and there's no right way. And, but I think that the second you do, you are separating yourself from half the people that want to do something. Right. So, right. um, you know, when I was the, the quick origin story was I was, um, 14 years old and I saw a camcorder for the first time and you know, I'm a VHS kid. I was like, not a super eight kid. I came up with, you know, right. VHS camcorders are really just getting started. And my, like that, like magic spark of like seeing something and being able to have it immediately there was like instantly like fascinating. And I, and I felt my most self self when I was, when I had it in my hands. And so I got involved with it. If you can imagine a time that cable wasn't everywhere, cable had to come to your town. Right. And so right. cable came to my town and they set up public access. So I would go do that after school when I was like, oh, school. wow. Um, but I it was actually like I was around 16 or 17. I, I was around you know, 16. I had a subscription to Rolling Stone and Rolling Stone did a piece on film school and mm. did profiled USC, UCLA, NYU and Columbia, I think. And I was reading about USC and George Lucas and Robert Zemeckis, you know, and I was like such a huge Star Wars fan, a huge Back to the Future fan. I was like, that's where I want to go. Like, I want to go. Like, I didn't even know you could go to school for film. Right. And I couldn't get any information. The only thing I could get was like a magazine called Premiere Magazine. That was the only access to the film world I could get. In right. And, and Sight and Sound Magazine was also around back in the day. I mean, days. I, <clears throat> they were there, but like, you know, like a, a small town and... Uh, right, know, right. It's not going to have sight and sound. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't even know to like go to that. And I like, couldn't, you know, going into Boston was like dangerous then, you know? Right, right. You know? So you always hear about kids going into, you know, Mattapan to buy fireworks or, you know, Jamaica Plain and get mugged, you know? Right. So right. you didn't want to go into, so I had no, I had no access. Like books were so limited 
And when I found out there was film school, so I went to go, you know, I sort of put my sights on that and went to go visit USC. And I was like, I left a Boston winter to go visit and could not believe what a California January felt like. And I was like, I have to come here. And so I uh, came out, went to film school, got into USC film school, um, was like the only one in, in New England that applied that got in. So I felt really honored. And uh, as I was going through the program, I realized that there was, the program was not going to, undergrad program was not going to leave me or send me into the world with anything mm. um, in my hand in terms of a film. So I, uh, before there was Kickstarter, I started hustling and raising money while I was a student so that it could be a write-off for people and made a short film uh, outside of the school, but inside. Is that Rorschach? Was that That's Rorschach? Yeah. 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 And so it's like a 30 minute twilight zone piece, you know, and I got the cameras donated from Panavision and film from Kodak and leveraged all my credit cards and, went totally broke making it, but it, it really was the the calling card I needed. It got me two things happened at once or sort of three things happened at once. First, I was out there just hustling my VHS tapes. I just get in my car, like anybody that RSVP did my screening, anything in the, like if I could get even a bite. In fact, while I was at Universal, I snuck into the mail room and grabbed all the inner uh, office like memo like envelopes and I would just stick my tape in and send them to people and just start writing executives names and write confidential on them so they would get <laughs> onto the desk which fucking worked by the way <laughs> you know, I, you know, I I exploited everything I could possibly get my hands on I mean the idea now when I remember when like streaming started catching on and YouTube was around and people were like how do I get my movie out there I was like oh my god like it's the amount of money I spent copying VHS tapes, you know, <laughs> right, right. stupid. I couldn't believe it. So, and you had to wait, you had to wait for the entire thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Label yeah. them and hustle them and get them out there. And like, and, you know, people had to watch them and I had to make a trailer for them. Like I couldn't, there was no email. There was nothing. So it was just right. like the analog time, but a few things sort of all happened at once. The, the tape through a series of getting past, like somebody saw it and somebody saw it and somebody saw it. And then it wound up in Steven Seagal's VCR. Oh, wow. And he was like just before the downturn, right? So right. Like, it was like right, caught him right there. And he brought me in under his deal at Warner Brothers. And so Lorenzo de Bonaventura gave me like a movie deal off of my short. Wow. And, and I was like, oh, my God, like this is exactly how it's supposed to work. Like I'm going to go to Hollywood. I'm going to make a short film. And when I was making Rorschach, you know, Robert Rodriguez made El Mariachi, you know, for $7,000. And that right. changed the game overnight. So suddenly a short film wasn't enough, right? And, but, you know, it's definitely got me in the room. And in the case with Steven, he was, you know, extremely generous and, you know, got me in front of Warner Brothers and was like, you know, I want this guy to make this movie they had, this project they had. And, you know, that was the first time I learned about development and development hell and all those kind of things. But, you know, I had a movie deal, but I didn't make any money until I made a movie. So I was actually still temping in a mail room at a law firm, you know, because I didn't want to work in the business. So I, I temped on outside jobs. So I was, and that actually was where my tape had also got into the hands of Diane Keaton. And oh, wow. Diane uh, met with me a couple of times because she was looking for a visual consultant. So my, oh, my track was very graphic and very visual. And she was looking for somebody young that could take these notebooks that she would have of, in, of visual inspiration and see if we could come up with a way of communicating to translate that into the look of the movie she was trying to make. And yeah. that was on Unstrung Heroes uh, back in the early 90s. So that happened. And then the third thing that kind of happened all sort of at the same time was that an Israeli producer named Zuri Maimon uh, got a hold of my tape and brought it to the guys that eventually became Millennium, which were then called New Image, mm. to come make this karate movie for them based off my short. And that was actually my my first real gig was making this uh, karate movie that was, because when I was cutting Rorschach, I was cutting Rorschach next door to John Woo when he was making his American debut. Oh, wow. So, uh, steam he back, you were cutting on the old like online steam back type of cutting? Or yeah, like I was already? cutting on top head, right. I, they, they, yeah. I've got, the last show that was cutting film, the last show to cut film was Murder, She Wrote. So I was in an editing room sandwiched between Murder, She Wrote and the foreign language dub versions of Death Becomes Her, this Bob Zemeckis. <laughs> right, and I'm right. between them and across the hall is John Woo cutting Hard Target, this Van Damme movie. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, John Woo's a master. 
So I like I'm watching laser discs, laser discs. I don't. I mean, I'm sure they have to be explained, but they're like right. gigantic DVDs for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And you flip them like records, and of the killer and hard boiled better tomorrow. And um, you know we and that like and that was like and that and what Rodriguez was doing El Mariachi was really like my first real big introduction to like genre directing and yeah. uh, and so I got this like million dollar prison karate movie that was like a very like the first John Woo knockoff. It's like a rip off of Hard Boiled called Hard Justice. <laughs> uh, prison you know with guns and cf agent and it's like it's become sort of a cult film like you can actually and for whatever reason it like still has one of the greatest reviews i've ever gotten in my career for something like somebody saw it in, at the can marketplace in the early 90s and just like variety wrote this incredible review for it and so people wanted to see it so and it cut a great trailer you know there was no cgi back then so it just cut a great action trailer I, you know, I should send it to you guys sometimes you'll get a kick out of it yeah yeah i'd love to check um, that out but it uh it you know and that and that started getting me genre work in television so right. and then, you know and it was like a job a year and then two jobs a year then three jobs a year and that was all the way up into my 30s and dune is really what changed the game in a big way and started getting more credible projects and pilots and now we're in the you know in the in the aughts at that point um of the yeah and so you know, and then I, I work steadily. Actually, the the trickiest thing career wise, you know, the easiest thing if I'm telling to any young filmmakers, like mm -hmm. you know, when you're just getting jobs, it's easy. When you're just hustling for the next gig, really, a career gets built on your choices. When you start getting mm -hmm. presented with choices, when it's like you have to turn something down and take something else is really right. the hard work begins. And. and it must have been a very, you know, like another major milestone for you working on House, which at the time was, you know, extremely popular, you know, uh, um, um, winning Emmys um, for the acting, but then also yourself getting recognized uh, with an Emmy for directing. And to me, the Emmy is the coolest looking statue out of all of them. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, it's got like the wings and it's so big, you know, a couple of buddies of mine have have one and. It's the one thing that I'm very jealous of because it's such a cool looking statue. But also what it means is a pretty, pretty fun thing. Um, what what was that whole experience like working on a house and then being recognized for your work as a director with like the highest achievement or the highest recognition in that field? You know, I think one of my friends put it really well, which was that, you know, that category, you know, the, the Emmys were around for 60 something years at that point or whatever, but he's like, that category hasn't been around for 60 years. And so you right. were in a very, or 50 years or whatever it was at the time of that ceremony in 2008. Um, you know, you were in a very rarefied group of directors that had been, you know, honored and to be in the business, you know, almost 20 years at that point was you know, out of body. You know, I was, I was not only the dark horse, but it was like, I would be publicly called out as having no chance to win because it was, my episode of House, the Breaking Bad pilot, the Mad Men pilot, and the Damages pilot, right? So right. they were just like, oh, Greg Butanis has no chance with his episode of House. Right, right. And so it was, uh, so I kind of went in just to enjoy the night, you know, of like, course. Was, like married to my boy's mom then. And we were just like, let's just go have fun. Like, it, like, and then they were like, she was like, you know, they seat the, they, they know the winners. So they seat them towards the aisles. So they don't have to climb out. And I was like, and then when we got in, like our seat was like, dead in the middle you know, <laughs> as far away from the aisle as possible so i'm like okay and then like it was i like I, it was like a like a like the, you know when you see like a car accident in a tv show it's like it was fragments of memory it's sure. like I hear my name i'm walking down the aisle i'm thinking don't trip on the stairs and then i'm like you know and i didn't really have a speech prepared it just spoke from my heart so it that's was, awesome man congratulations my son, you know who i dedicated it to uh, has it in his room at his mom's house right now. So oh, he, that's awesome! Yeah, it's such a cool statue. I was uh, away with the uh, House House of the Dragon. Is it the first time you've worked with the uh, virtual production, and how has the experience been versus shooting on location? Yeah, that was. I've done some LED screen work. Um, interestingly, on Snowfall first, we were using it in place of a trans light out the window of a location. So the um, and again, used to solve a problem. The real location wasn't practical, wasn't safe. There was, you know, they 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 had an inherited location from a previous season, but it wasn't practical enough to go there 
consistently throughout the season. So the LED screens outside the windows instead of a translate, which is a static, basically just a blown up picture, um, was we're just talking about virtual production. Yeah. Uh, was, you know, and I, I was really like, I took photos of it. I'm like, wow, what a great tool, like to be able to have cars moving and adjust the time of day and be able to play with that and make it come to life more out the windows. Um, and then when I uh, was asked to come on to House of the Dragon, there was going to be uh, volume work. There was, um, they were going to originally build the, Warner Brothers was going to build it in Burbank. And we convinced them to build it in Leavesden, in, uh, in, in London for us, Warner Brothers. So they, at the time, it was the biggest volume in the world. Um, and, you know, the, you don't really need the biggest volume in the world. What you need is two volumes that are like medium size. Like you need to have one you're shooting and one you're prepping because the, 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 you know, just like a factory, you know, you're just like, it, 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 it's like, you can't do anything with it until you're done with it. And then you have to wait to prep it for the next time. So there's these big gaps that you're going crazy that you want to be doing stuff on it, but it's going to be, and is, and should be used the way you would use location or use a standing set. So you should mm -hmm. just in your arsenal for us on, on house of the dragon, it was, it was used on the bridge um, to because the bridge itself was impractical to shoot. You know, the real the real location that was used in the original series is not a a really a, a attainable location for any length oh, of time. Interesting. You know, so that scene when when Hightower and Damon meet, that's all in volume. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Correct. That's on the volume. So that. Um, and that was incredible. I mean, that was a great use of it. it actually works really, really well outdoors. Yeah, and that's interesting. It was. And then we used it in that same episode in the sept um, with all the candles. So mm -hmm. the altar. Oh, my real. God. What a, what a great. I just got some chills, man. That was a great scene. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, yeah. That was really good. The the Do you know a gentleman named Randall Kleiser by any chance? Uh, I know the name. I don't, we don't know. Each okay. Other. Yeah. Speaking of mentors and he also does a lot of work with the DGA and Dennis and I actually collaborated with Randall in creating a volume back in the day on, on sunset, back when I lived in California still before I migrated out of there. Right. Uh, and maybe one day I'll go back, but um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Randall's also very involved in the DGA and he's obsessed with like, you know, trying to bring uh, special effects chops to like the director's, in the guild and stuff. And he and I worked on some things together, but anyway, um, yeah, going, going back to house of the dragon, um, and specifically, um, you know, um, the, the King and Patty's, you know, performance, when you first meet him in episode one, he's got a little bit of that simpleton vibe and you're like, Oh, this guy, you know, there, you know, this, there's something off about this guy, but the more you watch the show, the more you really start to see who he is and what he, and what's important to him and what's important to him is actually creating this fascinating character because typically they show you, you got to show all the good traits or like all the interesting sympathetic traits right away. And with this particular character, it's like a true slow burn that in this last episode was just absolutely incredible. His, his scene of getting drunk and becoming more and more honest, you know, with himself and the people around him was was truly fascinating. The last two episodes of Patty have just been absolutely incredible. Um, what was that experience like, sort of honing that in with the actor and, and getting to that spot? You know, dialing that in with Patty was some of my favorite work. Yeah, like, man. I mean, I'm very excited about the finale, you know, which I also directed. And again, because you know, and I'm trying to avoid asking you about that because I know there's nothing I'm going to yeah, get. But I so. can tell you, you know, that was my only opportunity to work with, you know, Renera and and Allison. You know, I mean, actually, no, I, um, you know, specifically Renera. You know, that to, to deal with the adult storyline. Sure, sure. Um, you know, was really meaty for me. Mm. So to be able to uh, delve into Patty's story like that is meaty to me. You know, I was, yeah. You know, I I I, I am interested in Renera's growth and i'm so excited people have responded really well to her but like I, like again being like a single dad to a daughter like viserys's story really spoke to me you know mm -hmm. and so that's like where like a lot of complexities and when you are 
trying to do right by your kids and you don't know and like the 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 unwavering feeling of failure everybody has as a parent uh daily um and it's you know and it, of something that you know that there's no winner or loser on it's just like you constantly question the job you're doing and like those so that scene by the fire especially was poignant and then you know i love the stag scene because of the catharsis oh god yeah that was great you know and then the white heart you know was was great and i was i, I posted on my instagram uh you know just what we were you know the the cardboard cutout that that thing had been you know up until i saw it because i you know the paint's drying on the show you know we were just shooting this thing so right right I, I, the first time i saw it fully done was when it aired Oh, that's awesome. So, so like the, the thing that, um, Renera looks at like that beautiful moment of her looking at the actual white heart, yeah. um, after like, she's gone through her little adventure. Um, yeah, that, you know, the, the, the stuff with Patty, um, that, that, that was really sort of getting to me lately is that this guy's an artist, you know, like ultimately if he wasn't the King, if he wasn't a Targaryen and had that crazy white hair, He'd be like making model RC cars or model airplanes. He's yeah. like, he's like a little nerd, you yeah, know. That's his, that's his train set. He's like playing with his Legos. <laughs> like, that was, but but like he also he, he's got the weight of this family on his shoulders and this entire empire, and it's just like you can tell that he's no dummy. You know that maybe his passion is not in ruling Westeros, right. but that he's no dummy, you know, and that's slowly coming out in such a beautiful way, man. And congratulations, you know, for all of that, you know, that's great. I know Dennis is a huge fan. So Dennis, you, you have anything you want to ask about the last two episodes? Um, yeah, well, kind of obviously without spoilers. Um, cause you, you did, no, no, you can them. give spoilers for, for the first three. No, spoilers no, no, no. I'm that. talking about with the finale. Cause my question is about oh. like directing. Cause you're directing, um, two different, you, two different actors uh, for the same role. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, you know, you can't give away spoilers, but how did you approach that in terms of communicating with the different actors uh, for, for those same, same uh, uh, characters? You know, they were, you know, it's what's, what was nice about how Miguel cast the directors to the episodes. And it wasn't, I was originally supposed to direct, three, seven, and 10, because seven, I just like, I loved the script for, and that was like my way into the show in a way, like as I, oh, I, interesting. Saw, I had, you know, I was like trying to find like, you know, what's my, I always, I mean, whatever I'm given, I have to find my way into the story. And for whatever reason, seven really spoke to me. And because of the logistics of, you know, production and, you know, being ready and getting the sets ready and doing everything else, um, seven got pulled up. And so Miguel and I needed to switch because really, you know, one and two are sort of of a piece. And, mm. you know, I actually found two challenging to direct because, you know, Miguel was in the process of directing one. So I didn't have so some of the doing it in parallel. Yeah. Well, we, yeah. the way it worked was we have two full units, not a first unit and a second unit. We have two full main units. We have the fire unit and the blood unit and they are oh, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> in parallel. So we are, at any day of shooting two episodes are being shot that day mm. and the director dp first ad second ad and editor move between the two units depending on what's going on so sometimes i'll have six weeks with a unit sometimes i'll have a day with a unit and then sometimes i'll work you know one day a week sometimes i'll work for six weeks non-stop so it depends on what it was and the rhyme or reason to who what unit you used and was a bit of a mystery and Toby, uh, you know, Ford who was doing the scheduling work and as a producer on the show, like did the Lord's work every day because COVID changed that schedule. All I knew what I was directing was what I was directing the next day. Because if it's okay to ask, when, when did you guys start filming? Like when, when like we started filming, I mean, Miguel started, he started a little bit ahead of us. I want to say back in like, March of 2020, like in like when COVID first hit. No, it was like, yeah, because I came out in. Let me see. Let's see. It's right. I got back in. But yeah, I know 2021. Okay. Okay. So okay. It was so, it was so like, one year had gone past already, and we had yeah. gotten sort of used to it at that point. So, but you know, like I was doing two pretty close to one, just because I was originally Miguel was going to be doing 
two. So I did, I came in to do two, three, and ten. I was gonna like I wanted to do the finale when I read it. Um, I also felt strongly to that. And then mm. Miguel wanted me to do three because of the battle and the logistics of the medieval hunt. So, but what was actually great, and it was just you know serendipitous, is that there is a lot of connection between two and ten. They are mm. like real cousins and and antecedents know. yeah and so when you see the finale you'll understand what i mean by that but, yeah 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 you know, i think that i think that there's um so in a way it was for a lot of the characters i could draw upon things that happened in episode two you know in in terms of internal life you know mm. more than you know what the plot was it was about you know, things said and done in episode two that were coming to fruition in some way internally in the character's journey. And that like was the great part about it. Even though the same actor wasn't playing Renera, uh, you know, we could go back to and sort of talk about the conversations we were having back mm. then. And, you know, it was in a way, you know, you know, an incredible journey and, and to like, to do that, you know, I did that with, Picasso, you know, I was with Antonio Medeiros and, and, and Alex Rich, you know, it was like, you know, but you weren't necessarily having sort of the same threads of conversations. There were such very different times and very different circumstances. And here, you know, there was, um, you know, so much said and done in two that I think energizes uh, the finale. So for me, yeah. the, and, the cast. And if you're a Game of Thrones nut job which i'm slowly becoming more and more every day like once you start reading the books it starts going to like a different level of nuttiness because george r, r. martin really brings you into that world and one of the most famous characters and maybe the most pressure is the character of damon targaryen right like you could tell that that's george r, r. martin's favorite character in the books like yeah. the, like the special attention he gives that character you could tell is different than every other character he writes about um, and the casting of Matt Smith, I think, is just absolutely perfect. But that one scene that is such a twist of, of of like emotional expectations because you're like, wow, the brother's doing the right thing and he's going to help out his other brother. And like the moment that that uh, a squire or whatever gives him that message, I did not in a million years think that what that what happened would happen. You know, like I thought his brother was going to be like, happy about it to be honest with you but right. like you know but like just tell me a little bit about directing that scene because like from the camera angles because typically with game of thrones you have a lot of wide angle stuff and you have a lot of establishment of the entire world and rarely do you go close in on the face especially with the kind of lighting that that shot had when you see damon's face take up the entire screen and you pretty much only see this and like you see his lips kind of curl up with the news and it's just like Anyway, I'm a fan of that moment. Yeah, when he turns away after he reads the note before he... Yeah, yeah. When he turns away and he like kind of like gives you like this little thing and then he starts just walloping on that poor guy who yeah, was that... giving him a lot of respect. I mean, part of the thing you're responding to is actually was like a, was a mandate of the original show, which was that you could not give anybody a haircut. So right. one of the things, you know, Miguel felt very restricted <laughs> by was that. And so, you know we wanted to when appropriate add those touches you know the original idea was that you know the the visual design of the show would keep evolving as the season evolves i don't know if mm. that i think at the end of the day it's still game of thrones and we stuck to the to the template pretty closely sure um but you know there was you know that opportunity of getting inside somebody's head and i think that's mm. important because we're about to you know, the only way you know we shot that battle in six days which is oh wow you know, not a fraction of the number of days that Battle of the Bastards had or or the Long Night had that, you know, and what was great though, I had Miguel who had done all the great battles. And so you've got, you know, I mentored him in television when he transitioned out of film and it was great to be mentored back. You know, oh, that's first of all, that's incredible. That's incredible. You know, so he, you know, was saying it's like, you know, I mean, one of the things we kind of came up with is the only way we're going to get this done not dissimilar to Battle of the Bastards, he had a similar problem he had to solve, was like fo just following Damon's point of view and his character, mm. right? So that was the the way into that story, you know, was the only way we we're gonna do it. We, we couldn't be everywhere all at once. Um, you know, logistics wise, we, you know, went back in and 
did a small pickup of the of him rowing, you know, to help bridge that because you know there was some you know just getting in real water with a camera and a guy in a boat and tides was just not practical at the time. So mm. we had to we you know we were pretty lean with what we could get done during main production, and then uh, but it just it added to it. You know, the voiceover was something that came later. You know, originally he just read it and went off, and then he then he was kind of in the melee of like helping the squire back up and reading what the note says, um, you know, everybody's like, Oh my God, we're saved. And then when they go look around and Damon's gone, but his dragon's still there. Mm. You know? And so that, and you guys cut that out. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. Yeah. That, that's that's in, that's first of all, I actually think that's a good choice um, because like it, it creates this, this thing about what about that poor kid? But then you realize that kid isn't important. Like right. this is really about these two lunatic you know, like talk about privilege. I mean, this is like some next level privilege type stuff. Yeah. And uh, that's where the focus is. That That's where the tragedy is, you know? So anyway, I thought that was great. One thing I have to ask you, because me and all my buddies, you know, have been talking about this, is we all kind of, and look, I don't know if Dennis feels the same way, but we, we all wanted to see that last fatality, right? Mortal Kombat style, see Damon cut that right. guy in half. What was there? Did you guys shoot that A and B? Was that a choice? Yeah. Well, that was, a you know, again, I think, look, in television, I remember something I read when really I was obsessed with Monty Python, right? In high school. <laughs> and when it came to Flying Circus, the, you know, they said, you know, they said, if we had had twice the money, we would have been half as good. <laughs> and I think that that was really true. You know, the original script I read for three was much, you know, there was much more confrontation between Damon and Crab Feeder, you know, he talked. And oh, Crab Feeder talked. Whole, there was a whole, well, the design of Crab Feeder was something that I was really like kind of grabbed into, you know, like mm. it wasn't scripted with the mask and the, the, the gray scale. And, you know, he was written much more like the mountain. And I oh, wanted something like more spindly, you know. Oh, wow, with, wow. So, so you crafted his look a little bit after yeah. oh yeah. okay interesting so two there a couple of things that changed so in like in yeah if i were to get like one set of props i would want his hammer because i thought that would be an interesting like rather than have a sword for him we, we came up with a hammer and i'd want his mask because what sure. i thought was cool is that given that they're looting ships that his look uh would be oh, i see that he was a, you know that and because he was a prince there would be a certain vanity that he is covering so and that he is looting these ships so there should be this hodgepodge of things so the idea of the the mask and the idea that like another piece of mask was adhered to, it was a great um, design by Ellie was, you know, I thought it'd be interesting that the sons of the harpy base themselves and their look off the crab beater, you know? Oh, I see. And so that's why he's got the half like harpy mask. So it would right. be like, Oh, you know, like, remember like the story of, you know, Prince Dragar and, and the crab beater, like that's the, that's the image, you know, the way that, the anonymous or like in money heist you see they have dolly or anonymous has that particular mask sure use, who's, which name the name of the artist of that mask escapes me but the the thought process behind that was there and there used to be in the original script a whole sequence that went into the caves and there's right. like the whole, and you went into the whole like inner cave world of the triarchy and was there any was there any struggle or was damon pretty much just slicing through butter no, there was like the hunt to get him and there was like things to encounter. There just wasn't time, money or, or the schedule to do. But, it. but in terms of the crab feeder, like, you know, this is a, like when Dennis and I were talking about this after the show, he was like, maybe the crab feeders talent was that he was a great leader and a good orchestrator and a great thinker. But when push came to shove, he wasn't of the physical type. So he wasn't a hand to hand guy. So well, by that right. point, the match is over. You're totally right. I mean, he, that's why he has a hammer. Interestingly, Daniel, the actor that played him, had never picked up a hammer before. <laughs> he had never hammered something before. So we like it was like I've, I've encountered like when actors have driving stuff and they're from New York and they've never driven, they don't have a license. Mm. But I never encountered someone who didn't have a hammer. And so we like you know, and it was a very unwieldy thing. It was you know, there's the business end and there was like the meat tenderizer end, right? But you're right. I didn't want someone that was physically overpowering. I you know what I kept saying was there was no black hats and white hats, that it was, there's an equally compelling story about the triarchy that's rising up against the tyranny of the Targaryens. Right, right. I was as interested in Crabfeeder's story as kind of a, because you, you could make a 
hero out of him. You know, he's sure. like up in the shipping lanes. He's leading these men. He's like pillaging. Look he's at like, some, yeah. somehow he's he has stayed alive for three years and defended himself against the largest, you know, navy on the planet. You know, yeah. so he's obviously no joke. No, no, that's the thing. That's so great. Like I I was really into their story, the kind of way you would like, you know, in the, the, the characters in Rogue One, you know, like you're like, mm. oh yeah, these guys are fucking cool. They're going up against the Empire, you know? So I was I was like into that and wanted to keep that ambiguity too, that like Crab Feeder was like exactly what you said. He's like a great leader. He's not necessarily an incredible fighter, but he had the the brains and wherewithal to like pull this whole thing together. And plus, you know, the thing I wanted to introduce with Grayscale is that it does also start to make you go insane, you know? Mm. And so that was the difference between, there is differences in his look from episode two to episode three, you know, in terms of like the Grayscale overtaking him more, which is, you know, leading to a lot of it, but they're, you know, they're burrowed in, you know? So for, I think for Ryan, you know, he had a lot of um, comparisons to like Afghanistan, you know, with mm. that, you know, in terms of being not being able to, you know, you've got tank, you've all this weaponry that's not, you can't use it to win the thing you're trying to do. You know, the dragons are really ineffectual given the, uh, I mean, it's like, I can show you, I can show you a photo here. I was actually going to probably post this in the next. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to, well, a little show and tell. A couple of days, but it was like, you know, I was just talking about this today that like, it's important to kind of understand like what the geography was. And so like in that battle, um, there was so like here i'll just show you this picture so yep you know the idea was that there's like a kind of bottleneck that there's like the beach oh right? i and see then, and the beach was real so the beach was like down in cornwall and then we we because of the tides it wasn't practical to shoot in court like to shoot at the actual beach right wow so the tide's going to be there so what we ended up doing was we were going to look for like a location that was similar to um a beach right so that we could control it so we found what we found up finding was was like a rock quarry which yeah. had the high walls and the high cliffs and would give you so like this was the real beach right so that's like the, what the real beach looked like oh okay. nice where is that what what where in the world it's is that cornwall it's like the southernmost point of england it's oh, like wow big, it looks like big sur in california you can right see right the, I'm on top of the cliff there, right? Which is a great choice because in the book, it's basically Cornwall. Like, like that's basically where the thing actually, you know, yeah, that's you know, that's where the thing happens. Those are like the uh, the arm of Dorne. If you look at England versus Europe, which is obviously what George was thinking. Anyway, uh, um, yeah, yeah, continue. Yeah. So then we then we found like this, you know, anyway, this picture here. But this is like the yeah, this is like a rock quarry that we thought could be like. A beach like kind of a continuation that we were going to dress right right and so you know and it's sort of like you know when you're in it you sort of feel like okay i can make that work and right it looks like a wall it looks like an actual wall where you can put all your all your yeah. uh, you gotta come around your archers corner and you're you're back inside so kind of going back to the original idea then we find out that that rock quarry has some protected grass that some protected something eats so right. we can't go into it and we can't mess with it and we can't sure. do anything. So we decide to take it back to the back lot and then create the idea. So the story beach is looks like this. And that's why that the dragons can't really get in there because it bottlenecks Krabby's cave is at the very right. sorry, I'm like at this weird mirror function. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. It makes sense. It's so, really cool to actually see that that you guys are thinking that way when you're orchestrating this in some macro perspective. Well, of saying we, we had to prep it three times, right? So we had to prep it for the beach. Then we can't shoot the beach because the tides are going to be too much of a problem to shoot this in six days. Then we go to the rock quarry, which we can control and we can go move in. But then we like two weeks before we get the plug pull. So we decided to do it on the back lot, right? So each of those, and we decided to build like an L shaped oh, wow. L shaped set. Okay. And then, so each, this is the same set that we would keep redressing as Damon was moving down the field so right what that ended up meaning is that we needed to later like shoot people coming out of the caves we had to shoot people um you know, anybody like on the cliffs like the archers and stuff so we did like that kind of second unit because we couldn't physically but we we took the plan that we had for that rock quarry and brought it to the back lot mm -hmm. and then we had like a virtual we had a one side of the the l was um like a 3d psych it was like it looked it was 2d it was painted to look 3d but it was just a drawing of a cliff and then the other side was green screen. So when you look back, you can see Cornwall 
And then when you look forward, you couldn't kind of look forward because there was no set. You just, you had to like be super specific with your angles. And and I just had Nicholas Meyer on the show not too long ago, who's another great director who's done some incredible work through the years. And I always kind of asked, you know, when I have directors on the show, like how, what their kind of philosophy is because directors and I've directed some myself, you kind of have to split your brain a little bit between the sort of technical sort of mise en scene side of things, cameras, lenses, lighting, and working with your DP and your gaffer and all of the sort of visual side of storytelling. But then there's this other beautiful dynamic that's very complicated of working with the actors and actually getting those performances out is, is, Working with somebody like Matt Smith, was it challenging or like, what's your general philosophy? John, you know, he was not, he hadn't done anything like that before. Like he hadn't done that kind of physical action work, you know? And so I've done like action, like through my eyeballs for 30 years. Right. So like that, that and being able to, you know, and, you know, um, you know, Matt had an injury at the time that we had to be sensitive to. Mm. And, you know, so, you know, we were liberal in our use of a stunt double because you want to save him for when it really matters. And when it really matters, <laughs> he, he fucking rings it. And really what I wanted from him, like the, the, the thing is like, and I said it in the behind the scenes um, that they, that they have done a really great job HBO in, in, in putting together about process was like, you really, like he was going to die. You know, it was a suicide mission. It was just like, fuck this, fuck my brother. I am out of here and I'm going to like, die doing it it was a total hail mary he was and i'm convinced of that i was convinced of that watching it good that's what i want i had a scene similar yeah. in Manchi that i kind of modeled it off of in the second season at the end of the church and i wanted that feeling that matt and matt like that's where his brilliance is i mean he's so brilliantly constructed damon and you know down to the unpredictable under the fact that like the guy surrenders and then like fucks him over right that's <laughs> you know, great and then he's getting you know they put more arrows in than we originally had kind of planned. I would have zigzagged. I would have done more if they were going to put so many arrows. It's just like, it strained a bit of credibility for me of like arrows, 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 nothing's hitting him. Nothing's hitting him. Like I want, I would have him juke and jive and zigzag and hide. A little bit stormtrooper. Yeah. Yeah. A little star Warsy, but you know, Yeah. so, but they, I'm sure there was just like, they're like more, more arrows, more arrows. (laughs) There was a, that was definitely a note, you know, (laughs) but when we originally put it together, it was like, in the time that it takes to like what you know it's just like anything else like they shoot arrows where you're at so if he's not where the arrows are then he's got as much time as he can for them to reload re-aim and he's a moving target right right and it's harder than you think from that far away to like get him so oh it's very hard the idea was that he the first set of arrows go and he bolts he's just gonna fucking run down you see how long that is and go get crab feeder like he's just gonna He's just going to get shot up with arrows. It's kind of, we also looked at the scene in Dances with Wolves mm. when he goes on the horse and is just like letting himself get shot at. Yeah, which yeah, provides yeah. distraction for the arm for, you know, for Sea Snake and everybody in the cavalry to come in behind him and to save the day. So that was, awesome. you know, that was kind of the concept. And that was something that, that was like the version I had to go. And I had like, it looked like one of those detective crazy walls to Miguel and uh, Ryan pitching that version of the battle. And what's so great with Miguel yeah. is like, He's able to like cut through it and be able to give you, you know, having done like, you know, the greatest battles in TV or film history. Practically. Yeah. Battle of the Bastards is, is maybe oh the God. best I mean, episode incredible. of television ever He's made. Sat there and like, you know, and when you have like going to Miguel's house and you're watching Battle of the Bastards as he's breaking down how he did it, like, come on. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool it's that? just, and, and people forget that sh- that episode is so incredible because not only do you get the Battle of the Bastards, but you also get the invasion of Doreen or or yeah. or whatever. Oh, Marine, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. Marine. Like that, like is so sophisticated and like, yeah. Different. And yeah. you get you know, so this it was like you want to have the medieval hunt, and people probably would have been perfectly satisfied with that episode, right? And then you get like this other great thing at the end of the episode, which is you know this whole like seven. Yeah, minutes. yeah, you get these really intimate moments between Renera. And um, the knight, I forget his name right now. Um, um, but, you know. Cool. But to your point, the limitation of not being able to go into the caves, to not have crab feeder talk, to emerge, you know, to be reborn through the birth canal of the cave, uh, you know, was bloody, you know, like it was that 
provided the made the show better like yeah it, it, yeah yeah it, it was not good in the script it was perfectly great in the script the, the, like the third man it was like you know that was what i was originally thinking you know all the, yeah okay you know to be in the tunnels and, and, and from the art direction style i thought when he's dragging him out the way that he cut him was this weird diagonal yeah. that I've never seen anybody dismembered in, I think, ever in history oh, of dismemberments. I, I, and, like, I took a picture of a body and I like, like colored out all the part I didn't want, but I was imagining like what the slice would be. Like if it's a hilarious <laughs> feel that he just went in and just like took him. I didn't want it to be like, a, it was originally it was a head is what was scripted. Mm. I thought it'd be cooler to have like a torso and he's coming out. Just oh crazy. yeah. It was way cooler because I've never seen somebody cut up like that. Like that, yeah. this is some demented dude that just went in there and cut this guy like that. And the, um, the torso looked so much like Daniel. It was like really spooky for him. I wonder if I have like some. Oh God, that would be great. Of him. Like I just, you know, just, but it's like the, 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 you know, looking at the, uh, the whole What's... of the thing here. The, uh, the probably... I'm sure you've gotten this question a hundred times, but Damon obviously didn't touch any of the grayscale, right? Like he knew he was smart enough to know. Yeah, he's got him. Like if you like, I made sure of that too. I've got yeah. something. Oh, that's the other uh, thing. Yeah, this is actually like, they actually like used like in the behind the scenes, they used some of the uh, the goji berry pumpkin seeds. So like when we were uh... first putting it out on the kitchen table, <laughs> we were just sitting there like, you know, working out the, the details of like that's fun toys and stuff but there's i don't have the video on me right now but the um so uh there was there was some great like you know stuff i was taking on my iphone of just like that torso but i just thought it'd just be great to like have a slice and he's he's actually holding him by his like you know his uh, gauntlet right and like look i'm starting to get to potentially abusing uh my privilege of time with you because we're we're pushing way beyond the norm here okay. but um the other thing that like was such a subtle, but like, I don't know if you call it fan service because it didn't feel like that at all. It just felt like hanging out, like um, kind of reminded me of back to the future when you see Marty's dad. And for me, that was seeing the Lannisters and seeing these like, like ancestors of Jamie and, and, and Tyrion yeah. and all that great stuff, but still having a little bit of that Lannister, like, thing to them you know that was like it wasn't overt but it was a culture right it's a culture of being a lannister and yeah. i thought you did that brilliantly as well i thought oh, that, that was a great little touch in that. they were fun like i mean for me it's like i got to you know i nerded out with the easter eggs you know like there was a lot of uh you know any opportunity to lay in something that i know that like i would get a kick out of but like you know the the, the lannisters and you know the, them being twins and jefferson's work um in both cases was great you know kind of yeah, he was great. good he was good i love the kind of like gaston-esque <laughs> nature of his uh of jason lannister you know how he's like he's just like you know of course you're gonna want my honey wine from the thing like, <laughs> right. and like with the, the scene with the spear i mean we did some takes that i was just oh what a great scene that was. like because and the, you don't really get it as good a look at it as i had in my earlier cut but like the spear is hideous like i wanted i wanted the <laughs> our like armorer he would come to me and he's like i'm like i'm like no we're not going far enough like it needs to be hideous like it needs to be like at one point it was a good idea and he's like i'm like i don't want it. i don't want to see it again until you don't want to put your name on it <laughs> and he's like then he's like he came back and he had the tassel it's like, yeah, the it's like, it's like, it's like it's a, we want it to be like a dragon like i want a dragon mouth with like but, and I actually had a, I had a toy. I had all these like McFarlane dragon toys that were made that I used for all to like my dragon sequences, mm -hmm. as well as How to Train Your Dragon is actually a great reference of people riding on dragons that Roger Deakins consulted on. So yeah, that. But I would you know I would take the I was like I want the mouth open and I want this like flame coming out that looks like the spear and then whatever other hideous and then, <laughs> then I want to imagine that like and that looks probably pretty good and then Jason Landers was like no 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 bejewel it you know right castles, like it's not enough so you want to feel like the process was was absolutely like he just he just like completely it wasn't enough for a king like the king is yeah. gonna want more and yeah, so yeah it's great yeah, it was great patty does such a great take and i don't think it's in there but it's like he looks at it like <laughs> like, <sighs> like great like fucking right like, 
like this fucking guy like but like, but then but then look you gotta give lannister credit because in the end he does kill the stag with it right and like he he's like you know he does uh, but it's like you know i mean it's it's such you know the the the, the idea it's such they, an awkward moment by the way it was an incredibly down, like old man to come and stab people yeah like, you know whatever what a great mean, scene because like yeah. you truly felt how help like the difference between that i mean the contrast between that and renera is just so beautiful Oh, because good. she's really out there stabbing the boar. Like, you know, obviously you think of Robert Baratheon and the boar that killed him in the same yeah. in the same Kingswood. And, you know, like puts the other guy out, you know, Chris Cole or whatever his name is, put puts him out, and then she kills this guy, you know, you know, like 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 she stabbed this guy, you know, this boar yeah. with mean, her bare hands. Cole takes, you know, Cole takes takes it kind of mortally wounds it and then right 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 right. he, he does like, he sticks the knife you know like like the blade through it but at first he gets knocked down so she's left kind of like alone with this challenge right where she could die we i mean that was the thing it's like you know we we have like the guy in the blue suit but we wanted you know like boards are serious and i had a i kind of based it a little bit around you know i was shooting lost in hawaii and everybody talked about the wild boars and oh no hold on I, you worked on lost did i how did that miss me oh my god that uh and i was going i went to like you know you just you go to the edge of the jungle and you go to the tall like you go to those like tall weeds and i was gonna go take a piss and i was like at the edge of the thing and all of a sudden as i'm standing there literally with like my dick in my hand comes this like the grass like out of et or jurassic park the, the grass around me and i can't see what's in it does a full circle around me within like arm's reach and then bolts out and it was like a wild boar Oh, that, I wow. spooked, that thankfully didn't come to attack me but i you know remember just like there was nothing i could do it was it happened so fast and so crazy and well, so for, first of all that, I, you know we wanted a little bit of the i kept telling fabi and i wanted like the bruce willis like horse eye you know when he's like <laughs> you know with that you know i wanted that like the, right. whole, the restless horses but we shot that in one night and it was uh you know, it was a fun sequence to Oh, it was great. It was like, great. And like Ali, um, I believe that's her name, Ali Alcock, uh, the the, uh, really, the actor really. who played Millie, Millie, Millie. She is incredible. I mean, she is she's a star. Good. You know, she's she's uh she's Good a job. star. I mean, she they found her, you know, they cast Emma and then they found Millie in Australia. And she had done like a little indie film and auditioned. And she had a real like I'd love to like work with her on something too, where like you see kind of her more contemporary nature because she's so yeah. cool and and just her comfort in her skin is really cool to watch. And she really, yeah. you know, like, you know, she was, what was so great is she was so open and, you know, everybody, all boats rise with the tide, right? So you're going to be around Reese, you're going to be around Matt, you're going to be around um, Emily, uh, you know, Emily Best, you're going to be around, I keep, or screen names Eve Best, but we all know her as Emily. And um, so you're just going to keep upping your game, and yeah, that's great. You know, I mean, and, those scenes with her and 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 the king are just incredible. Like that last scene where you're like, "Why are you being so stubborn?" And just like the you know, your father loves you. You know, like like like. But then you remember, well, she's of that age where like she's a little bit you know questioning and rebellious, and she's yeah. you know she's a, she's a young child. Um, but like the fact that even when her father tells her all these reassuring things, you guys chose to not have her reply with words, but just with like looks and stuff. It, it's, it's excellent work. You guys really did a very nice job, you know, Thank with you. that. I think know, the, the show, show gets so some time with character in a way that the original show, you know, as it got more kind of rushed as the seasons went on, you got like mm. the your best, like, that's why like, you know, uh, the you know Sansa Mountain storyline was so great because you just spend time like just them riding and bantering. Like I love sitting with the characters and I love the expanded versions of some of the scenes that we did and the ability yeah. to go back and flesh them out even a little bit more. I mean that's because two is really a chamber piece for the most part. You know right. that, that um, and that's you know the the I think the spirit of the first season of Thrones that was so great was that. You, know, you opened with white walkers and you ended with dragons and there was nothing magical in between right 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 so, right you know that that was what was you know again so great is like you know this show holds its own even without 
the dragons and some of the other, you know, sparkly things that, that, that can attract you. And that at the end is just, you know, a human family drama and grabbing onto father daughter dynamics. Like I live it, you know, my daughter's nine, but she's nine going on 19. So it's, yeah. a, um, you know, it being the, the, the exasperation of that and trying to navigate that was, you know, really great themes to be able to play with in the second, third episode. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, first of all, I, and now I feel, um, you know, negligent that I had, I had not realized that you also had worked on lost. And now that I'm looking at it again, because I'm kicking myself, you also worked on heroes, which was also like at the time, like this cult thing, like, like you've really like to your earlier point, of choosing projects, you seem to have a very good knack for choosing very good projects in television. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of really legendary work there. I mean, like, thank you, thank you. you. Know, for, for me, Lost is a top five all time, you know, television yeah. show. It, and my just, kids, my sons just started watching or just watched it over their moms, and you know, it's a, you know, I'm 30 years in, you know, to professionally directing. You know, I mean. Mm -hmm longer since i you know i started you know when i was 14 in terms of getting interested in this and so to you know to be able to still be standing and be a one man brand one man company you know is you know is no easy feat and i'm i'm generous with myself and appreciating that you know it's like we had labor day weekend you know my fiance and i went and stayed up in montecito and got room service and watched the show you know or right having a watch party at our friend's house, you know, when the finale airs, because it's, you know, the, the good work, you have to celebrate these moments, you know, to have something that mm. breaks through. I mean, I, I'm, you know, 100 million people a week watched house. So I'm used to people putting a lot of a lot of people putting eyes on on the work. And to see this catching on and to do that and to be part of it, like it's it feels fantastic. You know, the journey, that's how the hard part is being away from your family, you know, my kids, you know, oh, I always much credit to my kids for their patience. Um, because, you know, I couldn't travel back because of the way COVID worked in London and quarantining and all the, all the restrictions. If I left the country, I couldn't get back in um, without, you know, disrupting production. So, mm. you know, they were, everybody was really patient and generous because they knew it was important and they knew this one was important. And so the fact that they can drive around town and see the billboards and see the, you know, all the merchandise and all the things that are kind of coming down and they know everybody's talking about it, like is, is exciting. And I'm excited for them that, they've given me a lot of leeway yeah. on, uh, on this one. First of all, I'm excited too, man, because we get to benefit from your beautiful work. I can't wait to see what, what you get your hands on next. Cause um, it's, this has yeah. been a true honor. Dennis, yeah. do you have any final words for the, no, I just want to, I just want to thank you for your time. And I think you gave, gave a lot of great advice and you have so much uh, wonderful experience and tons of things that are uh, definitely way up there for, for us to look at. And so, uh, yeah, just thank you again. I appreciate you guys having me. This was so great. Like it was, it was so fun to be able to chat. So if you guys want to reconnect after the finale, uh, we can we can then. Come oh, out. first yeah. of all, I I love that because um, you know, trust me, the whole time I'm like I'm gonna ask him what the name of the episode is, but of course I'm not. Even though I've actually read the like I've read the book, so like like I kind of know what happens. But you guys have already made some very different choices. Well, it's so so like, like it's a history book, right? So who's yeah. writing the history and how do you exactly that and against that? And you know, I mean that's all history, right? So yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's sort and of like George R. R. Martin himself like has admitted that, right? That it that that fire and blood is from a very perspect, you know, specific point of view. Yeah. Uh, you know? Yeah. Um so awesome Greg. Well thank you so much for joining right. us and I will hit you up after the finale, sir. Sounds good guys. All right. All right thank you. Nice meeting you. Thank Take you. Care. Bye.